Welcome to The Good Time Show. I'm Damon Epps, your host. In this episode, I would like to introduce you to Roland Smith, an accomplished author of fiction and nonfiction books for young adults. Prior to his career, he spent 20 years as a zookeeper and worked on wildlife conservation efforts after the Exxon Valdez oil spill. Today, we'll be discussing his latest novel, Switched, which explores the consequences of the world without power and the links people will go to survive. We'll also dive into how Roland Smith made his way to Bentonville, Arkansas, and what's next on the horizon. Get ready for an engaging conversation with one of America's most talented authors and my good friend, Roland Smith. Yeah, good. Sounds great. Yeah. Sounds great. I will nail that. It's the switch, but that's okay. The switched. The The switch. The switch. Not the. Well, Roland, I can script everything, so. Yeah, I know you you can. I'm not really here to really... um, be accurate. Be accurate. Yeah, absolutely. You, know, you are And accurate. I won't be accurate either in honor of... Oh, I appreciate yeah, that. Yeah, I'm just going to be myself. That's, re- that's really kind nice. Kind of semi-okay and sometimes, you know, not so good. <sighs> Should we dive into your latest novel? or How do you want to do this thing? You, I know. Why am about, I... We can talk about Benville. We can talk about Blake Street. We can talk about anything you like. I'm just okay. here having a nice conversation with my nice. friend Damon. I know. How, we Okay, let's dive in. When did you... Do, when, did you when did... Wow. <laughs> <laughs> evidently you look really pretty today because yeah. i'm stumbling over yeah, my words go. it really is when did you decide that you wanted to be an author i mean i really started trying to write books when i was like 17 and 18 but but i wanted to be a writer when i was a kid and uh um i i loved books before i knew how to read you know my parents were big readers and they had books on the shelf and i'd pull them down and wonder what those what marks those were, were. In the book, I just liked them a lot, and um, I don't remember just being, the look of them, just the look at them and the feel of them, and and uh, the smell of them. You know, now Kindles don't smell so much. They don't. But um, so I I kind of fell in love with the idea of being uh, an author at a really really young age. My parents probably didn't have much money when I turned five years old. I wanted a bicycle for Christmas. Mm-hmm. And I went down Christmas morning hoping there was a bicycle there. And uh, <laughs> my parents had an old typewriter there, which my dad probably found in the junk heap some, and cleaned it up and gave it to me. And I I kind of burst into tears because I didn't know what the heck it was. Oh, you were pissed. Yeah, I was kind of upset about it. And I they carried it to my room, and I kind of fell in love with that thing. And I Was it like the... Old, and, and, it was and, old and, and Underwood. I know you're not, was it like the, it, I mean, it had to be. Yeah, manual. What am I talking yeah, about? Of course, a manual typewriter. Yeah, I, this was in the 50s. I was about to say, I, 50s. I had manual typewriters yeah, in school. Yeah, and, and uh, you know, I I love that thing. I taught myself how to type by, and this is when I was like six or seven, I covered the keys with uh, electrical tape. So you couldn't see what letter was oh. what, and I taught myself how to type and when I got to where we got typed, we used to keep teach typing in school. I, I typed faster than the teacher, and I didn't have to take that class. And so I, I you know, and I still love. How old were you th- when this was going on? Thirteen. Okay, years so old. you're th- at twelve yeah. or thirteen. You were typing faster. Back then, than. you used to have typing courses, and you, you would go to even public schools, and they would, you'd have to, they'd go in there and test you to see if you actually knew how to type. And I, nobody did, but mm-hmm. I did because I was an early geek. I guess. You an know. OG. So I was really interested in writing and, and was a, a good reader, fortunately for me. And I uh, uh, don't remember who taught me to read, actually. You know, I don't remember. I don't have a memory of that in school, but someone obviously did. And uh, I'd read books and I think, God, you know, I'd like to be able to make somebody feel the way I feel when I read this book. And um, now when I write a book, I actually try to, Create readers. What, what does that What does that mean? Create readers. Well, I mean, some people are what they call reluctant readers if they don't have some kind of mechanical problem. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? I mean, they just it just doesn't quite do Click. it for them. And uh, for me, I try to write books that will get them to read another book. Meaning, the book moves along fast enough, they're engaged enough where they will go, man, I like this. I'd like to read another book that I like. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. And so when I write a book, I try to create readers because I'm a guy that was really created by being a reader. Got I mean, it. everything I know has come from books. I mean, I've read two or three books a week for 60 years. So I've read a lot of books and just kind of 
what I I would love to make a living reading books, but I mean, basically what I do is I write every day and have for years, and then when I'm done writing, I read books um, because I like to. I'm still a big fan of other authors and how they get things done. And I know this about you because you've mentioned it to me and other people. You started writing a, a page a day because of promise that you gave your mom. No, 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 that, that wasn't that me. Up? Yeah, oh, didn't that's I really that? a great story, though. Maybe you I'll know start what? Maybe we should, you should that really my start doing that because did I did, be really good. Did yes, you not mom, say that? Yes, my mom. You know, said, you didn't no, say that. No, never. I kept my writing kind of a uh, secret for most of my life. My, my first book came out in nineteen ninety, and at at that point, I was a research biologist working in the field. And okay, wait, back up. You kept your writing a secret. I didn't talk about it ever, even with your mom or anybody. And nobody. Or? So Nobody. you were writing kind of, where were you writing? I'd you were wake ri up early in the morning and write for an hour or two. And what were you writing about? Oh, I'd write novels and stories and okay things like that. I mean, I just. And this is like 12? You were like. Well, probably older than 12 okay. when I was really serious about it. I was working, but I'd wake okay. up before going off to mess around with animals. And uh, I'd spend a couple hours writing and go to work and not say anything. So when my first book came out in 1990 it was it was actually about the sea otter it was a non-fiction book about the oil spill in alaska which i led a team up to we can get into that later but um, we're, we're getting into it now i mean we're and when it came that. out um it was a big splash in the paper and the sunday paper and colleagues people i know people i worked with were mm -hmm. shocked not only that i wrote a book but they didn't even think i could probably read <laughs> <laughs> so it sort of stunned them a little bit you know suddenly there's rolling and we don't really know what he does and apparently he, he's been writing books okay and these are the colleagues at the zoo when did you how did you get into becoming a zoo person okay. it was an accident i uh i wanted to go to college I graduated from high school, I wanted to go to college, and I thought I should major in English literature and went down, told them I wanted to do that, and they said, great, do you have any money? And I said, N no. And they <laughs> said, do your parents have any money, they asked, and I said, no. And they said, you know what? I go, what? And they go, y you can't go to college. you got to get a job. And I, I was stunned. I mean, I was 18, and I, I thought, God, i got to go to work. School's been free the whole time, but now it costs money. So I was looking for a job, and I couldn't find work because at 18 I had no useful skills. And I saw an advertisement in the newspaper, and they said wanted someone to work at the Portland Zoo. So I went up to the zoo, and I said, I hear you have a job. And the guy goes, yeah. And I go, what is it? And he said, zookeeper. And I said, great, I'll take it. And he goes, well, wait a second. Do you know anything about animals? And I said, no. <laughs> and he goes, you're hired. <laughs> it's a true story, and I and I thought I would stay stay there about a year, but I ended up staying at the Portland Zoo for ten years. And when I left the Portland Zoo, I was the uh, senior feline keeper. I was in charge of all the lions and leopards and tigers. Oh my! Oh my! Oh my! And then I I went off. That's fascinating. Went, do you think it was like helpful to get the job that you know oh, anything? It was because great. I can talk. We could do a whole segment on working with animals. It was hugely helpful to me. Not only to give me money and allow me to go to school, but um, I, I, I was really good for some unknown reason at uh, what we call manipulating animals, handling animals, catching animals. And I went off from being a senior feline keeper and I became a lot of things at a different zoo. I was a curator of mammals and birds. I was a general curator, I was an assistant director. Um, but my main job is I was a research biologist. And as a research biologist, um, because the skill set I had was manipulating or handling animals, was that I was uh, kind of one of the guys they would call when there was some disaster with animals in the world. You know what I mean? Oh wow! Yeah, and so, so when you when you say manipulating animals, do you mean like catching them? Oh, just catching them. Catching them. You had it? Did them, you have a um... taking care of them after you after you capture them and stuff? Because in a zoo, it's very hands on. And the ten years I worked in a zoo, I worked with basically everything, and I was kind of the young energetic kid who was willing to Risk try and do anything you know what i mean I go, we, we can figure this out and that that's what that job taught me as far as working in the field so you have field biologists who get you know get the degree in wildlife management and get their masters but one thing they don't 
teach in college is how to actually ma- physically manage those animals. But in a zoo, you're physically managing Got it. animals all the time. You know, it's a it's an odd, arcane skill set, and be, because of that experience, you know, I was one of I was that guy who was called in and say, well, how do you how do you catch a sea otter? You go, we'll figure something out. Or how do you catch a beluga whale? You go, well, we can somehow. I don't, we figure we can out. do it. We can figure it out because, and then you're backed up a lot of with a lot of experience of working with other exotic animals and it's really a young man's sport i mean pretty old now i mean i couldn't i don't have the speed and you know balance to to do that anymore but when i was young i was chased down a pretty tiger. good at it i sort of knew what animals were going to do before they knew they were going to do it your ability to connect with the animals and understand what they were doing just came yeah, naturally. Beha- behaviorally it did not not from uh not from growing up with animals. That's that's why I said it was odd that they hired me because I, you know, I mean, we had a dog and a cat and a turtle. You, do you know what I mean? Those Which turtles I didn't, are vicious. I didn't pay much attention to any of those things. It really wasn't my thing. But um, when I started at the zoo at eighteen, I I got really interested in animals. I mean, I went off and you know, I mean, like the first day I worked there, they go, "You're you're taking care of the giraffes and the hippos," and I go, "Okay." What, what do I do? And they go, well, just go down there and someone will be along. No one came along. So, so I had to figure it out by myself with these tall things and those are mean other things. Right well, they can be. But 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 I had to kind of figure it out. And the first day of the job, I worked with all those animals and then went to the library. I went to a bookstore, bought more books about those animals than I made that day a lot more. I spent a lot more money trying to figure out what the heck they were getting ready for the next day. And the next day I said, okay, I know something about them. I spent all night reading about giraffes and hippos and rhinos and things like that. And uh, the next day I said, okay, I'm ready. They go, great. I go, where am I supposed to go? And they go, you're going to take care of the cats, which I read nothing about the night before. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? So that, that was kind of my career for a, a long time. You know, I was a, the new kid, and you know they they uh, sacrifice the old keeper, sacrifice the new kid. You, you know, all the weird jobs and stuff. The old guys would go, yeah, we're all gonna go do that. Just go in there. We one time had a we had a a bear get out. It wasn't outside, but it was still in the bear grotto. And they said uh, the old guys come in. We said, hey, Roland, uh, the bear's out. It was a black bear. And I said, oh yeah. He goes, yeah, we want you to go in there and get it back into its cage. No kidding. This is true. They used to do this stuff all the time in the old days. And I, I went, well, how do you catch a bear? And they go, we don't know. <laughs> and so I go, okay, well, I'll go in. All right, that was good. So I, I go Smith. into the bear place catcher. where the bear's loose, you know, and they're out there with first aid equipment and everything, you know, and I, I walk in and first aid equipment. What is that? Sort of they work, got a band aid kind of figure out a way to get the bear back in with food and so forth. And I was quick back then and, get the bear in and lock it back in his cage and come out. And they go, did you catch the bear? And I go, I did. And then, and they said, how'd you do it? And I go, I don't know. And walk off. So two could play that game. And, and, and that was kind of the, the sort of the big joke when I was a zookeeper, I was always the, the kid who got kind of picked to do these things that, you know, I mean, nobody wanted to mess with it, and nobody right. wanted to do it. Nobody really knew exactly what they were going to do, and so they would send me in to do things. And then this knack of like being a wild—I mean, being a zookeeper and being the guy—it it propelled you into a in a crazy couple of directions. One, I know about the um, the wolf. Yeah, I you started. A, I was a wolf biologist for twelve years. I ran the. Red Wolf Reintroduction Program. I had this really cool job title. I was called the the Red Wolf Species Coordinator Stud Bookkeeper for the United States, which was really awkward looking on a business card. But so I worked for the zoo, but I also worked with the Fish and Wildlife Service, and we were the first people to release wolves back into the wild. And um, nobody had uh, done that before. Nobody had successfully done it before, and our wolves did good. I mean, they started to reproduce the first year we had them out. We had plenty of glitches. I wrote a book about it actually called 
Journey of the Red Wolf years ago. And, and uh, that program led directly to the Gray Wolf Reintroduction Program in Yellowstone National Park, which I also worked on. Super sick. And a lot of the, the guys that worked for me with the Red Wolf Program ended up running the the uh, Gray Wolf Reintroduction Program in was Yellowstone. It a, was the Red Wolf's a problem at one point and now they're fine? Or how are the Red Wolves now? They're not, they're not fine. I mean, wolves are never going to be uh, perfectly fine. There's really not enough habitat to bring them back. I mean, that's kind of the thing. But the, but the good thing about reintroduction programs, uh, the kind of the secret is that we have really, really good endangered species laws. There's a very powerful, powerful law in the United States. Uh, but we don't have really good endangered land policies. But when you take an endangered species and you put it onto land, like whether it's Yellowstone or some of the places we release, we release red wolves, uh, because there's an endangered species there, the land is managed differently. I mean, there's a lot more r- rules because there's an endangered species there. And I think, uh, you know, 50 years from now, they'll look at these programs and go, well, I think these, some of these reintroduction programs um, probably saved large swaths of land across the United States that would have been, you know, basically destroyed if there wasn't an endangered species. Because mm-hmm. there's certain things you cannot do if there's an endangered species living on various habitat across the United States, if that makes sense. It does. Yeah. Okay, so then the Exxon Valdez oil spill. Was yeah. That, that, is that, did it happen before this or where? where it was kind of sort of during it. It happened in 1989 and Exxon Valdez, we, I worked at a zoo called the uh, Point Defiance Zoo and Aquarium in Tacoma, Washington. Okay. I was the research biologist and general curator and they, the oil spilled and we were, we were paying attention to it. But a few days after the oil spilled, Exxon Valdez called and said, we, you know, we, we don't know what to do. You know I mean? It, it, these sea otters are getting oil. The birds are getting oil. Everything's dying up here. Is there a way that you could lead a team of biologists up to Alaska and help catch these sea otters and help us put together a plan for rescuing them, you know, cleaning them up and eventually let them go and said, okay, I can do that. So we, I put together a team and we flew up to Alaska and it was really interesting. Um, I think what Exxon did and and is they said, okay, we're going to spend a billion dollars on this, on the cleanup. Wow. And so when I landed, I mean, everybody was very friendly in Valdez, Alaska, and they were saying- Were you angry about the spill? You know, for me, I don't know if I was angry. I, I mean, we, we can get into that later. I mean, okay. we don't use double-sided hulls because it's too expensive to retrofit these tankers. And I'm not sure that the captain was, you know, he got blamed and- in big trouble for running it up on the Bly Reef, but he actually stopped a lot of oil from spilling by running it up further on Bly Reef so it didn't, like, you know, 50 million gallons spilled, but it could have been far worse had Got he it. not had the sense to actually sort of on the Got surface it. make it worse, which he did. I mean, he ran it up onto the reef so it didn't rupture more tanks. You know, he didn't try to take it off and tear tanks out. So, I mean, his name was Hazelwood, and so I think he was really, everybody has to be, you know, we always need a scapegoat, and he was someone has to be vilified, and he was, and you know, and was he drunk and pointed? Yeah, probably, but so is every <laughs> tank, tanker guy up, seaman up there. <laughs> Everybody is. Everybody. I mean, there's, there's a bar. Yourself, there's like, a bar every. How you 20, get there? There's a bar. Yeah, you get there, every twenty feet. And, but anyway, I mean, that's all in the book, and you know. But the thing that was interesting is that when I landed, you know, I had my team and we flew up there and we brought a bunch of equipment with us because they didn't have anything in Valdez, Alaska at that point. We got the plane and there's locals there waiting for us. They go, you know, you can stay at my house for free and here's a car if you need a car, you know, here's a free car. And uh, you, you drive to the school where the, the gymnasium where they had the, the sea otters they had. Uh, first captured it, and there there there's people parking cars and stuff and being really friendly. Well, it turns out that Exxon went in and basically paid everybody. I mean, so they were paying the people so you could stay at their house. If you took their car, Exxon would pay them a certain amount of money for that. The guy in the parking lot parking the car was paid, you know, forty bucks an hour. So everybody was being paid, and and I think that to some degree their strategy was that. If we can prove, you know, we're going to get sued, obviously. But if we can prove they made more money on the spill, 
than they ever made before. It'll go better for us. You know, I have no evidence of that, but I think that's what they were doing. It was interesting. The boats we went out on, you know, with the nice captains and stuff, mm -hmm. they, uh, you know, they get 5000 a day. Do, do, you know, for us to be right. on their boats as mm -hmm. we're out there trying to catch sea otters. So that part to me was interesting, aside from catching the animals. And it was a, uh, it was very hard. I mean, you know, you're, animals are dying. yeah, you're in Prince William Sound and the weather's really rough and there's oil and we wrecked many zodiacs on the rocks and we got dumped into the water several times and with oil on us and, you know, it was hard. I mean, it was a hard thing and, and finally sort of figured out how to catch the sea otters, you know, the best way to wash them and other things. On the bright side is we learned a great deal about uh, sea otters. You know, no one knew much about We had them at our zoo, you know, but no, we didn't touch mm -hmm. them. We didn't know how to immobilize right. them. We didn't know how to, you know, really do anything with them except feed them and keep them alive. Um, they're cute little animals. They're very cute. Well, they're big. They're a lot bigger than you think. They're like 90 pounds, and they're they're good size, and they have really big teeth. And uh, so you had, to, you had to figure a way to handle them and how to get the, you know, they would lick the oil off their fur and swallow it, and it's toxic. So you had to get the oil off their fur, of course, but you also had to clean the oil out of their stomach so they didn't die. And we figured out ways of doing that. And you know what I mean? And the baby sea otters came in. And how do you raise a baby sea otter? You know, we don't know. We know now. We know now. And so. So this is like the first time really people had started. Big with a big one. I mean, a few people have found a few things and they died. They have really weird metabolism. Sea otters do they? They uh, get too cold or they get too hot and then they die. Either way, so they have to be just kind of just right. And huge debates. I remember going to a meeting up there and I think there were twenty seven veterinarians from around the world there, debating what, how to immobilize a sea otter. And did we lose some? Yeah, but not. Not as many as you'd think. You know really? I mean? Yeah, we captured maybe overall, not just me, but the other crews up there, maybe 400 sea otters. Wow. And we were able to release most of those. Some of them had to wow. go into captivity um, because they were like the pups, the 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 young ones, you know, they were, you know. They got sick. You can't let them go them. again and have them survive. And we, we did release a few pups, but a lot of those made it into captivity and, um, you know. Is that a good thing? Well, it's okay. I mean, it's okay. The point is Exxon, you know, ended up footing the bill for all, all that. that stuff. And we spent like $40,000 on every sea otter we saved. Wow. Some astronomical number. That's probably not accurate anymore. It was a long time ago. But it was a lot of money because we had to fly seafood in from the East Coast. Right. Because we couldn't use oh, the contaminated. Wow, so we flew it in every day and... You know, everything had to be flowing in and um, because everything was just so horrible there, you know. And, you, you, you know, you have grizzly bears on the beach. Right. And, you know, it was it was very interesting. The, and this propelled your first book? Was this no, was the Sea Otter book or the? Yeah, it was the first book, yeah. So that was your first book? It came out in 1990. What was the book's name again, just so I can? The sea Otter Rescue. The Sea Otter Rescue. It's still in print, which is shocking for a nonfiction book. And it, it uh it. It kind of sort of launched my career. We didn't allow a lot of press up there because they kind of got in the way. When you sat down to write, like you were already writing, but you hadn't really written a nonfiction because this was a nonfiction. Or yeah. Was this a, so it was a nonfiction book that you. This was kind of the propelling of like your kind of your your um your method, I guess. Yeah, I had tried to get books published and and nobody wanted them, and you might ask why, and it's because they were terrible. I mean, it's pretty simple. I mean, they weren't any good. And um, so I, my first got, book got published because of who I w was as a, as a biologist. You know what I mean? And I had the photographs. I mean, I took thousands of photographs right. on the boat. And it was and a huge story. It was a big story. You know, it's still a big story. Yeah, it's still you a know, story. I, I speak at schools, and I'll say, have you guys ever heard of the Valdez? And all the kids raise their hand. They're still wow. teaching that in schools. Oh, and wow. going, yeah, I go, well, you know, I, I was kind of involved in that. Yeah, pretty, really involved in it. So it was interesting, you know. I mean, it was an interesting thing and a big, a big disaster. And I had the skill set to f not to catch sea otters, but to figure out what what we what we what we need to do. So what is so what what is that method? So you took that and you you made a 
what was the base, I guess, around the story of, of um, Sea Otter Rescue? It's narrative nonfiction, and so I actually go into the uh, captain's viewpoint and kind of what happened, what super tankers are, and why it happened, and, you know, I mean, which there was a great deal of inf information about because, you know, the press really analyzes what the heck happened up here, to ha what made this ha happen, and and so I kind of start from the very beginning um, when they uh, – go up on Bly Reef and what they were doing and why they ended up on top there, you know, and then what do you do about the sea otters and sea otter metabolism and why oil and sea otters don't mix and what that oil does to their food base, you know, because the oil eventually sinks and it kills all the clams and crabs and stuff. So they have no food. They can't dive down and get their food. They can only dive down in pretty shallow water. You know what I mean? And they're, they're not like a whale or a, a dolphin, um, they can't avoid oil because they have to stay pretty close to shore. And this oil comes in and it, and it always goes to shore. And the, the big problem up there is that the oil um, sort of stays on top of the surface because the water is cold. And then what it would do is it go into a bay where there are sea otters. Then the tide would, wind would change and it would come out and it would go to the next bay over. So the oil would contaminate Probably a thousand miles uh, of beaches over and over and over again. Eventually, we got clever and we started to figure out where the tides were and and where it was going next. And we would go in and catch all the sea otters before they all got there. So we would net, put up a big net, catch an entire group of sea otters, bring them into captivity before they got oiled, and we with the oil went away, which it did eventually, kind of. Um, we would take those sea otters, put them back where we had got them. You know what I mean? But at first, you know, you're not really ahead of the game. You're behind the game. You know, right. you're catching sea otters that are dying and oiled and in pretty bad shape. Right, you're just trying and to... And eventually we got just damage control kind of ahead of that and uh, started figuring out really better ways of preserving the animals because we figured out, where the oil is going to go next. And it's much better to catch an animal before it gets into trouble than after it gets in trouble. Much better for the animal. I yeah. hate seeing those little sea otters with all the little oil on them. I yeah. still see those pictures of those little... What do we say? What do, what do Marie and I say? We say, I used to be famous until I became an author. <laughs> <laughs> Did you kind of quit your job after that and start really focusing on being a writer? Or? Not, not right away. I wrote some other nonfiction books, you know, about animals and things I'd done. And... and uh, I probably left when I was, I had maybe six nonfiction books out. And they, you know, they were doing okay. I mean, I, mean, I didn't make enough money, but I kind of reached a point in my career. I'd been around a long time, you know, a couple decades. That, that If I really want to fulfill my original ambition, which is to become a writer, I need to focus on that. So I kind of left at the peak of my career. So I left after I had the Red Wolves back in the wild and did some Gray Wolf stuff in Yellowstone wow. and had some good offers and turned them all down and said, I'm just going to write. And it was a mistake. <laughs> I mean, it took a long time to uh, get established, you know. I mean, I had a novel come out. No, nobody knew who I was, you know, and or it didn't really care. And, and uh, It's a real hard decision to chase a dream. It, it, well... When you're young, you're kind of pretty optimistic, you know what I mean? So I don't know if it was a hard decision, but um, getting paid every two weeks and then getting paid every six months, and during those six months you don't know how much money you're going to make, is a difficult transition. Mm -hmm. I started just to write novels, which stay in print longer, and they did pretty well, and 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 started visiting schools, and that's, that's a, a, a good thing to do because you kind of promote your work, and they pay you a little bit of money to visit schools too, which I, and I like doing it. And that kind of gathered things up and things stayed in print. I mean, I made a living for 30 years and still am making a living as a writer, which is a lucky thing. Yeah, it's I mean, very I mean, cool. it's very lucky for me. I'm very grateful for it. Now you've written 40, 50? Over, close, close to 50 now, I think. Close to 50 books. Yeah. You have, what, three in the works right now? I have three books coming out this year. You have three books coming out this yeah. year. And the latest one is... The, the switch. switch, yeah, the switch, yeah, that came out in November, and uh, it's with Scholastic, and I, I wrote the book because I think we're, I, I love technology, I love gizmos, I love all that, 
stuff, but I also think they're very. That's what makes a man nowadays. Yeah, really exactly. Like, you know, back you in know, the day, got, real men yeah. like threw axes. Yeah, now no, we tinker with no gadgets. No boats. We have yeah. gadgets, we have and gadgets. stuff, and and uh, <laughs> but. I think we're really dependent on this technology. And what happens if all that technology goes away? What will we do? I mean, your ATM machines, your banks, everything is really done electronically. And there's some vulnerability in that. It could it could all go out. Let's say that a, a electromagnetic pulse happens and suddenly nothing works. Anything with a chip and it stops working, which is cars, your watch, Cell phones, you know, computers, ATM machines, uh, electronic cash registers at grocery. Nothing works. And it's all possible. It's possible. It's possible. And I thought, well, what will you do without that? And, and again, I grew up in the 50s. We didn't have any of that stuff. You know, so I kind of have some experience in not having chips and electronic gizmos around and stuff like that. I remember I started writing a manual Underwood typewriter. And... And so I kind of went from there. So I, I placed the, the switch on our farm in uh, Oregon. We still have a farm in Oregon. I, that's why you used to ride. It was kind of fun just knowing you and then talking to you, knowing your wife and, you know, knowing the kids. Like, yeah. the, obviously, the names in the book have similarities of, like, people that are in your life. Oh, yeah. Um, and the Luds are the Luds, the Luds are part of your family, right? Or the, we, well, that's what I call them, but it's, it's actually a, a joke after Luddites, which don't, people who don't like technology. Oh, in the it. old days, they were Luddites, and they didn't like any of the uh, manufacturing that was going on and stuff and automating things, and they were called Luddites. And and um, so I just called them the Luds. N- you know, nobody gets my jokes. But anyway, in my book, you know, you say the Luds, and nobody yet has brought up the fact. You go, he must be the Luddites, you know, because they don't. So they're kind of <laughs> prepared So a Luddites bit. don't like in Technology. technology. Well, back, it happened in like the 1800s in England, but where they didn't like um, the manufacturing going to machines. You know what I mean? It wasn't computers back there. It was basically machines in like the uh, the textile industries and stuff like that. They didn't like that because it took jobs away. Um, and so they're, the Luds is the family that live on the farm, not the Teeters, which is what, who actually originally lived on the farm. And... Uh, <laughs> And so I just kind of sort of based some of the people on uh, some of the relatives there and stuff like that. And suddenly, what would you do if everything went off? I mean, it would be an emergency situation every minute of every day. I mean, getting food and getting around. And, and they're lucky enough that they have a a, a wind turbine. They, they put a wind turbine up. One of the strange uncles had put a wind turbine up. And so they actually have power. Which is very similar here in Arkansas. There's a lot of uh, <laughs> oh, preppers. Preppers. They're yeah, preppers. preppers. I mean, so yeah, it's, definitely, some... it's definitely a prepper novel. I mean, in a way, I'm not a prepper, and I even have jokes about that because during uh, that thing, uh, Y2K, many years ago, many of the family members thought everything was going to end because of Y2K. I didn't believe it was going to. And they go, you know, you're not saving food. You're not gathering stuff. What are you going to do? And I'd go, and there is a joke in the book. I go, well, I'll eat your food. You wouldn't let me starve. So I kind of took that and pushed it kind of way out. So it's basically a, an adventure book, and I and the main character, he uh, he kind of gets a chance to see, of course, on the farm. But then he leaves the farm and he sees other people how they're dealing with it, and they go someplace else where another group of people are dealing with it. So we get to see kind of a. Uh, sort of a good cross section, pre- yeah, of of how different people do depending on where they are, mm-hmm. so or the who L- they teamed up with, or yeah. Who's in the Luds or- have a pretty, pretty good because they're all kind of pretty self sufficient and have been. They live on a little farm south of Portland and have been kind of trying to make that farm work for many many years. And you know what I mean? They know how to grow things and they have equipment and they have old equipment that doesn't necessarily have a chip in it, so it still works and. You know, it's kind of an interesting um, thing. And, and uh, that book took me a long time to write. It It took maybe, I wrote some other books in between, but probably five years to do, which is a long time for me. And uh, How long does it usually take you to write a book? You know, it depends on the book. I mean, you know, you know, I kind of write sort of full time now. I don't travel as much as I used to. And so probably a, a year. You know, I have three books coming out this year, but that's mostly due to, you know, 
they're not very long. I wrote them pretty quick. And then COVID happened, and so it kind of stacked books up a little bit. Things got delayed in publishing. And so I have three books coming out this year, which is, like, very unusual. I usually have one come out every year. Um, and now people think, well, God, you wrote three books? Why well, didn't you just write them? You know what I mean? They've been kind of ongoing ongoing and on the, at the publishers and getting edited and getting – trying to figure out what list to put them on and stuff like it just happens to be that 2023 I have three new books coming out two novels and a nonfiction book everybody wants to be a writer they, a lot of people do yeah everybody wants to be a writer yeah and I, I I think anybody can become a writer I don't I don't think that writers are born I think they're made I mean I certainly wasn't born as a writer I mean I didn't you know I don't think I had any more talent than anybody else but the thing that I did was I was serious about it and spent a lot of time actually writing. And that's, that's where things get difficult. You know, people want to write a book, but they don't really understand how much time it takes to write a book. You know, I work downstairs in the library day, here every day and I look at all those books and people kind of go through them. And, and I always think, you know, they have no idea what that author had to go through the, the the amount of time they had to spend to do it. So I'm real open about writing and telling people what I know about writing and stuff. Um, people say, well, aren't you afraid to give them your secret? I go, well, there's no silver bullet. There's no secret. I mean, if you're willing to spend the time it takes to be a writer, then it's likely you'll become one. I write seven days a week, 365 days a year, and I never take a day off. You know what never. I mean? I, I just don't do it it's kind of what i do now i just wake up in the morning and the night before get ready to do this thing i do and hope for the best i mean i would probably be shocked at how much money i make an hour if i was to break down how much time i spend actually doing it it's not i'm sure it's well below minimum wage you know and, and it's really all i really um, like doing I mean, I, I like writing books. I like figuring out the problems. It's, it's similar to the animal business. You know, you you show up at the zoo or in the field, and <clears throat> basically you, you solve problems. And when you're writing a book, it's the same thing. You solve a problem, and you're not. Or as men, we like to fix things. We like to fix them. Yeah, we just like to fix things, and it gets, you know, frustrating, but that's part of being a writer. And, you know, kids say, well, do you believe in writer's block? And, you know, I. And I go, well, kind of. I get blocked. And they go, well, what do you do? And I go, well, I, you need to understand, I get blocked every day, several times a day. And they go, what do you do? I go, I just show up. And I just work on it until somehow it fixes itself. Sometimes that takes a really, really long time. What is your definition of writer's block? I don't know if I believe in it. Um, you know, I mean, let's say you go to a doctor and, you go, man, I'm sick, doc. And the doctor looks at you and goes, I'm sorry, I have medical block. I can't I can't help you. Or you take your car to a mechanic and he goes, eh, I can't help you. I have engine block. No pun intended. Well, kind of. You know, I can't help you. I'm just, just not into it today. Yeah, you, a buddy of mine told me one time, um, and it kind of helped me because, you know, you know, working in the creative business and trying to figure out, like, you know, what you're going to do next or, you know, you worked, you know, you develop a TV show for a year. Like yeah. I have this cartel show that I worked tirelessly on. Mm -hmm. It didn't sell. Somebody's actually interested in it again. I'm super excited about it. Um, but I was just, I was living and breathing like cartel information yeah. all day long and yeah. just, um, but when you get off of that, like that was my world. <laughs> it was like, you know, yeah. it's like I'm Damon Epps. I've, I've never done law enforcement. Yeah. I know that's shocking. Um, but I, uh, that was kind of what I did. So when you get off of that, your brain has to kind of, settle regroup and all of that and i used to get really down and i would be kind of like and i'd be like man i feel like i'm getting depressed or whatever and i can't think of anything i'm just not creative right now mm -hmm. and um i'd always be down on myself and i'd really beat myself up my buddy said something really smart he said you know during the time when you're not thinking of anything he goes that actually is part of the creative process absolutely and a lot of people think of it as a negative thing where they're like oh you're having writer's block or it's negative but he goes he goes, you shouldn't look at it like that. He goes, it's just part of the process. It's it's not like there's a block and all of a sudden this is good and this is bad. He goes, you're just, your brain is looking for the thing that's in, that that it finds interest in. 
and when it locks into something, because otherwise you're just going to work on a bunch of crap that you really don't care about. Yeah. Um, but the minute you find a story or something that you think, then you lock in on it, then your brain starts to develop. And then all of a sudden, next thing you know, you're in the process again and you're excited. Yeah, and you're you, you, developing said, the you show. said the magic word several times, and that is that, you know, writing isn't an act, it's a process. And that's the true, I think that's true for all arts, whether you're making films, reality TV, whatever you're doing, painting, it's a process, it's not an act. And I think a lot of people that want to write books sort of think it's an act. You know, they get this thing and they'll, type it out and it'll be great and they'll get rich and everybody will love them. And, but that's really not how the, how it works. It's a process. You sit down. If I, if I finish a book on Monday, say I send it, I send one off to the publish, finally done. You know, I think it's done. And uh, the next day I start working on another book. And the interesting thing about it is it's as if I've never written a book before. You know what I mean? It, right. It, 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 it's, it's, it's still a fresh process. I have no idea what I'm doing, even though I've written many, many books. You know what I mean? The fact that I've written those books really has nothing to do with the new book that I'm working on. It's a different thing for me. And I think that that's one of the things that keeps, that makes me as a writer show up every day because I don't know what's going to happen. You know, I never thought about like if, if we lost electricity, Planes would also just fall, uh, you know. If like, you lost the chips, yeah. Yeah, like if, if... Yeah, if you lost the electronics, they would fall. I mean, they would stop working, and they'd be up in the air wherever they were, and they would have to land or crash. Yeah, and I'm assuming that's or what... both. I guess that, that was the process of, like, what would happen? What would happen? There's no radar. There's no... Nothing works at airports. There's no air, air traffic control. There, I mean, there's nothing there... You know, things don't work. I mean, now because we use chips and everything, radios, everything. I mean, it's basically in your car. It's in my car. And unless you have really old cars, they don't have chips. And in the book, we have some cars that are old enough that they didn't get affected. Kind of lucky for those people. The old clunkers, really old, by the way. Kids are going, how old? They're old without electronics in them. We've been using that for decades now in cars. But, but, um, and how do you, manufacture new things because the manufacturing doesn't really work anymore. I was working on the switch during COVID and, uh, that probably helped. It did help a little bit. Because the social I, part of it is super interesting, right? But people got really angry toward other people. Yeah. People kind of got lost and then they grouped up with people and they like the gangs and like, did you take, you, I guess you took a lot of that. I took a lot of that because I mean, think about it, everybody's basically unemployed. And then in Portland, where I was, when, when COVID hit, you know, I mean, there were a bunch of riots. And, I was, oh, yeah, Portland uh, got big, crazy. It was a big deal. And kind of like with the sea otters, we got better at taking care of people with COVID come in that were injured and we were able to kind of save some of those. And that helped the other ones because we we got more experience in how to how to do it. Is it does that make sense? Yeah. I mean, I no, it does. I mean, it's, yeah. in, it's interesting, you know. Well, I think we'll be better at world disaster now. Are you from Oregon? Yeah, I was born and raised in Oregon. Yeah. What part of Oregon? Yeah, Portland. Oh, you were born, born Portland, and raised in Portland? Yeah. yeah. And we had a, Marina had a small farm, family farm, we just talked about in the switch, uh, just south of Portland, maybe 15 minute drive from downtown. So we had some acreage. And uh, the way I ended up here is Marie said, well, I'm going to fly to Bentonville and I'm going to buy a house. That's what she told me. And I was working on a book and I said, okay. Because I thought that was funny because I didn't even ask her what it was. I went, okay. And then she wrote back and said, well, are you kind of curious about it? And I said, is it downtown? She goes, yeah. I went, okay. You know, I need to change. I've, I'd been working at the farm for 30 years in a little, very small little office, pretty isolated. And I thought it'd be really fun to live in a little downtown area and walk to my office. I wanted to be like, Atticus Finch and To Kill a Mockingbird, I wanted to walk downtown and go to my little office and work on my books and walk home. That was kind of the, the image I had in my mm -hmm. head. No office came to the surface. I mean, you know, a few people said, yeah, we can get you, you know, but it never really happened. And, and I came to Blake one day with my son-in-law. And when uh, when Roland's talking about Blake, uh, oh, we sorry. are members of Blake, Blake Street. Blake Street House, that's where we're Blake Street so House, saying, you know. and there is a, it's a social club. We talk about it all the time here. We are in the Sound Lounge. 
Yeah. Um, and there's a little library where yeah. it's the only place that you're supposed to have to be able to work and work on your computers yeah. and all that kind of stuff. And talk. And that's and how we met. So just to and that's how we, that is how we met down there. And I like the fact that I'm working, for people listening to this, I mean, I'm sitting there and I order breakfast. It's almost like assisted living in a way. It's kind of weird. <laughs> and I thought when I came to Bentonville, I'd be a big fish in a little pond. Well, it turns out that there are schools of big There's fish. There's a lot of big fish. <laughs> I mean, that's uh, that's fish. literally the whole reason why I'm doing this. Entrepreneurs and people doing really changing cool the world. things. Changing There's literally things. people changing the world and, and here. And it shocks me. Heidi and yeah. lots of money. Lots of money. Yeah. Lots of big, great doing, money. Doing big things. And uh, this town is an amazing place. See, everybody I know is from out of town. Right. Kind of, they come in. I'm going to Bentonville, you know, and then they're here like, for what? a day and go, Wow. I'm moving to Bentonville. I mean, seriously. I mean, every day. I mean, me. Yeah, it happens, you? happens all the time. I mean, people have really low expectations, and this is a st interesting town. This is a town where, when you're walking around town and people are smiling, but they're not smiling because you said hello. They have big smiles on their face when they're mm -hmm. walking down the street. Yeah, that doesn't happen in big I, I'm cities. I, it doesn't I, happen. All the friends that I have at this place and all the people that I meet, it's all genuine. Like yeah. everybody here truly wants to help. I mean, I, I sit down and just, I think I'm a likable fellow. Yeah, you are. So. You're okay. I'm all right. Okay <laughs> is all my parents ever wanted. They were like, if you can just make it, you know, you're going to be all right. Team up with a guy named Roland. He'll teach you how to yeah. read. Um, but I've been amazed I, I how many people how, have just sat down, had a conversation with, they were like, what do you what do you do? And I was like, well, this is what I do, mm -hmm. and these are my interests, and I I don't know where I want my life to be. I don't know yeah. where my future is. And they're like, oh, well, I want to introduce you to all these people. Yeah. And they legitimately just go out of their way to connect me with some of these incredibly powerful, smart, driven, cool, and just cool people too. With, with, with nothing for with their nothing. own benefit. With nothing. Not with not with not benefiting themselves in any way. I mean, it's it's a really it's a special place. Special place, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's just a different place. Everybody's really nice to everybody, and I think that some of that is because you have no idea who you're talking to. Roland, I want to do something really weird on the show. Yeah, go. But I'm going to answer my phone because it's my mother. And well, you should answer your phone. I should answer. Mom, hello, Mom. Yes, sir. How you doing? Fine. Didn't you tell me 2.30 or something? I did tell you 2.30. Is she not showing up? Let me call you back, Mom. Okay. All right, bye. Sorry, ladies and gentlemen, I will cut this out of the show probably, but my mom... Uh, <laughs> I like your mom. Your she, mom has stayed My in mom is very cool. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that was a lot of fun. Yeah. That was a lot of fun. Hey, Hot. Oh, you are on the way. Okay, great. Perfect. Sorry, mom's got a new caregiver. Yes, sir. Sorry, mom. Uh, she is on the way, but I'd like you to say hello to Roland. He is uh, the house we stayed at. Say hello and say thank you for letting us stay at your house. Thank you, Roland, for letting me stay at your house. Well, thanks thanks for staying there. <laughs> he said thanks for staying there. <laughs> <laughs> All right, bye. Okay, sorry about that. You've got a grandson. He's starting his whole journey in life. Oh, yeah. Do you think life's harder now to start a journey, or do you think – what do you, what do yeah, you think about I, – I think it is. I think it's – first of all, it's a lot more expensive. Um, so when I was – I left home when I was 15, you know, lived in – Hate Ashbury and hitchhiked oh, around and did that whole thing and it was kind of alternative and so at fifteen yeah. you went away from school and I went did. to Hate Ashbury I in did. the height of Hate Ashbury summer love yeah I was there were you a hippie I had long hair but was more mercenary you just kind of had to fit in but I mean you know Hate Ashbury back then I mean. You'd see Jimi Hendrix every day walking down the street and Eric Clapton and all these guys were there. And you sort of took it for granted as a 15-year-old that that's kind of where everybody lived and was easy to, uh, you know, totally change. It was a really weird little blip in history. You didn't have a place to live, but it was easy to find a place to stay every night. And food was essentially free because they would, you know, make it up in the parks and give it to anybody who showed it was a really interesting scene so it was a kind of an interesting place for a runaway i was on the uh i was on the front page of life magazine when i was a runaway they had the the san francisco police board have you seen i can't remember what the thing is but have you seen 
any of these children and there were a bunch of pictures of people with a little black thing over your eyes and I was I was on that. No way. Oh yeah. Were your parents yeah. looking for you? Yeah, my dad what my dad actually sort of knew where I was. He was a a colonel and I had lots of interesting connections. When I finally came home months and months and months later, he he, he knew to my shock where I was staying. Some of the places I stayed in. So he, he sort of knew, but didn't retrieve me. Because, you know, what's the point? Someone leaves, they leave, and you can't make them stay. And it was a really kind of a, you know, a big upheaval back back then. And, and I didn't did leave. You leave what did, you, did you leave because of No, not parents? because of any problem. Just, My parents were fine. I mean, you know, they were good. And I left because I wanted to kind of get on with life. I wanted to. That was kind of the mood of the world the right then. Yeah, I wanted to have my adventures and stuff like that. I came back and, you know, got my GED and got a scholarship to college and, you know what I mean? And started working at a young age because my parents made it very clear to all of us. We had five kids in the family that when we turned 18, we, we were out of the house. And so we worked. I mean, as kids, you know, we had paper routes and stuff. They didn't have a lot of money. Um, and. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of a clear thing that, you know, they were good going to raise you until you were 18. But when you turned 18, graduated from high school, good luck. And, you know, and as you kind of got to your senior year, they go, what do you, you better get a job or do something because in a year you're gone. You know what I mean? And I, right. I just left when I was 15 and, and it was uh, kind of convenient because of that sort of alternative lifestyle, you know, you could. You hike down to San Francisco from right. Portland, and you could like live on the street, and people would, you know, Not take you, you in and let you crash places. Yeah, it was relatively safe. You know, I had a few problems, but nothing serious. And so, um, I'm not sure where this is going, but I mean, that was kind of my my background. I always had to make a living. And then when I I went to Europe when I was 17, turned 18 in Europe, came back home in 18. You know, I mean, I'd finished my midlife crisis and I went to work and started working at the zoo. You know what I mean? I mean, that's really kind of what happened to me. It's sort of interesting. And for you kids listening, uh, that's not going to happen to you. I mean, it's just not the same. It's just not the same. same, not the same world that it was back then. It was just this little few years in time that I happened to be uh, born at the right time to, to go off and do this. And it, it probably wasn't the smartest thing to do, but it, worked out for me but it will not work out for you okay so you wrote the switch do you, do you have any glimpses of what's your next yeah i have a new series called the wilds which has to do with these uh two kids whose parents are famous conservationists and they spend half their time at their kind of wildlife conservation place in texas south of dallas not too far okay. and the other half of the time they spend out in the field all over the world working with their parents i started writing uh, in Eco fiction when I first started writing novels, and I got a little bit away from it. And, and now that I'm older, I kind of want to sort of end the career writing eco fiction. I have things that I think are important to say, and two of those books are done. The first one's called The Amazon, the second one's called The Vaquita. And the Vaquita is the smallest marine mammal or porpoise in the world, and it's found just in Sea of Cortez, and there's only 10 of them left. What, what animal is it? It's called the Vaquita. The Sea of Cortez is so amazing. It is amazing. It is and, I went and, swimming there. I did. Some, I, um, I went swimming with the, uh, with the. Um, I guess it was a seal, little little baby seal. Yeah, you could have. And they have like the huge. The baby seals out there oh, have the yeah. biggest huge. And I was swimming with one with a mom oh, yeah. right over there, just watching me the whole time. Yeah, and they have a people lot of said that probably wasn't the smartest thing in the world. But Marines' mom and dad had a house there, and I spent. Well, I've been there several times. But we spent three months there, and I worked on books when I was working there, and and. Uh, so I know it's in San Felipe, which, and so I know it really well, and that's kind of where the Vaquita is kind of based, and there's a lot of really interesting sort of complications there with uh, drugs and, you know, people making money, and it's a little fishing village, but it, 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 there's some secrets to San Felipe which impact the Vaquita and, a, and, a, and another endangered species, fish, that's there, and... and uh, so that's what that book's about, the second book. And the first one is about the golden lion tamarind in, in uh, the Amazon.
a reintroduction program in the mining. And so those are the kind of things I'm doing. And then I have uh, the nonfiction book about invasive species, something I've run into my entire career in the field anyway. A publisher said, hey, will you write a book about invasive species? Those are animals for the audience who doesn't know what they are, animals that really don't belong here, like rats are invasive species. So are cats. <laughs> They're an invasive species who are causing billions of dollars of problems here and around the world. And and they said, will you write a book? And I said, yeah, but I'm not going to write a 64-page book about invasive I want to write a big book about invasive species for kids, one that. And so it's kind of narrative nonfiction, kind of a, what they call meta nonfiction. I'm kind of in the book as I'm writing it, and it's I'm kind of happy with that book. When I got the contract to do that, Marie says, you're going to write nonfiction books again, you know, cause they, you know, they did okay, but didn't do anywhere near as well as my novels. And I go, yeah. And I wrote it and finished it and gave it to her. And she went, Oh, this, I love this book. And I go, good. Me, me too. It's not a, it's not a typical book. You know, the, the nonfiction book in schools and library, you know, the science books, you know, they're used once a year when the, Kids have to write a science paper, you know, and they pull them out and they're kind of bitter about it and stuff like this. And so I wrote a book that I hope they start reading and go, well, this is pretty entertaining. Are you, do you just feel like you want to speak to kids or is that like? You, no, no, you know, originally not really. I mean, I have to be honest. I I wrote several adult books that didn't get published. I don't think we mentioned this and they weren't because they weren't very good. And then I read a bunch of young adult books and I thought, I think this is a good voice for me. I think I can do this and I could do it. And I think that what happens to a lot of writers, you start writing in a certain genre and you're successful in it and you stick with it because you're good at it and because it's still interesting to you. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. yeah. That's not to say that I wouldn't sometime write an adult book, but I'm getting pretty old for that. Not that I couldn't do it, but I'd have to kind of reestablish myself, you know, with a whole new mm -hmm. yeah. group of, People, I mean, I've known pretty well to teachers and librarians as a young adult guy, and I'm not sure that I have enough years left to, uh, you know, unless I wrote a really stunning novel for adults, you know, to to change that. You never know. I mean, I haven't written that off, and, and writing for young adults is actually kind of a little more difficult than adults because you kind of are stuck with what you can write about a little bit. I mean, they don't really censor them too much, but you – you know, there's there's certain criteria that you have to use for a young adult, and you have to understand they're not as well read as I am, and so you can't use like gigantic words because then you have to stop the story and explain what that means. You can do it a little bit to kind of give them a little bit of vocabulary and explain it in context, but you, you, with an adult novel, you just write the novel. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And yeah, so, you, you and so you. So you're in a way you're a little freer, but on the other side, because I write for young adults, um, I get to speak at pretty big venues to young adults. I was at Baden School, which is a private school here in town, last mm -hmm. Friday, talking to the kids in their nice auditorium, and you know, doing my my deal, and you know, that's not something that's open to a lot of adult authors. You know, what I mean, you go to bookstore signings, and those are usually slow death bookstore signings are usually they're kind of okay, but not really. And, and you go to a school and, you know, before you go to the school, they buy everybody a copy of your book, you know? So you sell a couple hundred of them there and then they read it and like it. And then you get to talk. It's kind of like coming in and you're, you're a writer, but you're kind of treated like a rock star a little bit, which is kind of a fun fun. Yeah. It's great fun. It's, it's real fun. You, you have told me before that, like, it was speaking of, like, the way you have to write, the obstacles that are getting the way of the kids, like, well, yeah. the people can't, like, you yeah, can't. you can't have your parents they, solve the problem. Yeah. That's so the parents, you have to get rid of the parents. I get accused of getting rid of parents, and I do it all different ways. You know, they're too sick, they're busy, they're dead. I mean, you know. Because the kids have to figure out their own problems. Like, right, because your main character Because your main character is on its journey, and, and so you have need, to take. They need to resolve the problem. You know what I mean? So that is one of the criteria of writing an adult novel is that the parents can't be because the book would be two pages long. It would be it'd be just, you know, oh, I have this huge problem. 
mom and dad, I have a problem. They go, okay, we'll take care of it. End of book. I mean, that's reality, you know what I mean? But the, the kids I write about, the parents are kind of out of it. And, and it's actually the case in all young adult novels. Pretty much the parents are somehow not there or incapacitated, you know, and I've had adults go, you know, in all your books, well, I'm happy they read my books, but in all your books, the parents are gone. Do you have something against parents? And you go, no, <laughs> I'm a parent. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but the, these parents, you know, I mean, they, they get busy. They're not necessarily real engaged sometimes with their kids or the kids are hiding it. You know what I mean? And don't mm -hmm. want to go to their parents for some reason. Yeah, you know what I mean, and those are that is one of the things that you kind of have to figure out. You try to figure it out a little bit differently in each book, you know what I mean. But you, you basically always do it in the, in novels anyway, for sure, for young adults. You know, and parents do get mad about that. You know, kind of scold me once in a while, and that that's because they haven't written one so. They just don't know. Yeah, they just don't know. They just don't know. You know, or they wouldn't like it. Yeah. You know, they want to be included. They're like, yeah. I would do all this for my children. I would have done this. You go, yeah. Yeah, well, well you would have, but you lucky, know what? Lucky for your kids. My yeah. kids aren't so lucky. Yeah. You know, they they get problems. Well. So, yeah, well, where, last little question, what do you plan for the future? Where's your life going? I'm going to write some more of those books in the Wild series. I'm, I'm working on a book now called Pickpocket. It takes place in Paris. I've been working on it for, it seems like forever. I'm getting kind of towards the end. The deadline is way overdue. And I uh, hope I figure out the problems in that book. But I've been working on it here pretty steadily for several months. And uh, I'm getting closer and closer to figuring out how to resolve that book. And, you know. When I'm done with that and done with the wilds, I'll just write something else. You know? Good times. Yeah, it is good times. It's like it your show. Good times. It is good times. Yeah. Well, thanks, man. You know, you're probably one of my best friends out here in yeah. this in this whole uh, Bentonville world. So thank you so much for coming on the Good Time Show. I really appreciate it. I could keep talking to you for hours. Yeah, we could. But do I this. will, you yeah. know what I mean? We haven't yeah. even, we didn't even dive into when you were in Hollywood. I was like, yeah. I'm about to bring it up, but we're oh, out of yeah, time. It's okay. It is what it is. Yeah. Um, so thanks again, man. Thank I you. really appreciate you. And um, thank you guys for all joining the Good Time Show. Um, we will be back with another amazing guest, hopefully. And hopefully we still like it. And until the next time, have a good time. So long. Well, that's our show. If you didn't get a chance to watch the episode, check it out on YouTube and Spotify. You can also listen to The Good Time Show on Apple Podcasts or any other platform. We are always trying to grow our Planet Good Times community, so subscribe and follow us at Good Times Us on almost all social media platforms. This episode was presented and recorded live at Blake Street House Sound Lounge in Bentonville, Arkansas, a social club where people from all walks of life come together just to be themselves and make the community a better place. Till next time, good times, everybody. <laughs>